Hello, everyone. I'm Russ of Aquarimax Pets here with Nathan. And Nathan, Hello. thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And Nathan, now correct me if I'm wrong, but you have been designated an isopod expert by bugguide.net. Is that correct? Yes, bugguide.net. Yes. And uh, so that's super awesome. And uh, Nathan is a great resource to talk to about various isopod species that are here in the US. Uh, there's there's perhaps more species than you would expect, but at the same time, there are very few that you will have encountered. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, very few. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about those today, and we may field some other isopod questions. You want to talk a little bit about the uh, evolution of isopods as well? It's a very complicated, very complicated evolution. So some very interesting topics. So welcome everyone. I see we've got uh, quite a few people here already. Uh, and so we're going to kind of jump in uh, with some questions. We're going to start with a few from Patreon. So let's see, opening up Patreon here and a couple of questions. One came from uh, this question basically was asked by two different patrons, Ashley and Sandy, both asked similar questions. So they wanted to know how uh, isopods can survive the winter. Um, are they hibernating? Are they just slowing down? Do they burrow below the frost line? How does that work? Depends on the species. Um, aquatic species can sometimes burrow into mud to keep or, or to hibernate. It's actually hibernation. That usually actually occurs in the summer, though. A few species do it in the winter, but most of them do it in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, Porcelia scaber can survive the freezing temperatures as long as they're under something. They can chill if something freezes onto them, and that's around a 50% death rate. Okay. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? We were talking a little bit about that before the, uh, the stream. So how do the ice pods appear to be able to survive these extremely cold temperatures? The, it's basically in their blood. Um, it's, I don't know exactly how they do it. I'd have to look at the article again, and I'm not sure if science really knows how they do it. But it's probably a blood thing. Their blood you know, keeps from freezing. Because as humans, our blood freezes, and that's how we get frostbite and then damage. So their exoskeleton can be damaged by freezing temperatures, but they can't freeze themselves. And a few local or native species can go into crayfish burrows mm -hmm. and survive that way because it's out of the freezing temperatures. Because they burrow quite deeply, some of those crayfish. That's, that's true. Good point. Okay. Interesting. And, uh, and you mentioned that you've seen... For example, Porcelio scaber outside in the winter when it's very cold, out and about doing things. Some other species like Philosia muscorum will do that sometimes, or Porcelio spinicornis. People will find them out doing that as well. So that must be part of the reason because uh, if they have, I, I know that there are species of arthropod that have glycols in their blood that help prevent the uh, sharp ice crystals from forming. And uh, so it could be potentially something similar to that. Most likely, yeah. Okay. Okay, very cool. Okay. Well, another question from Patreon was, um, how did, can we help native isopods? Does leaving the fallen leaves on the flower beds around their house help them? That's from Ashley. Most, most native isopods are secure they don't need there are not many endangered species there are a lot of endangered subspecies the only way to protect them is to protect caves that they live in and you won't usually encounter native species in the eastern u.s northern u.s um, over in the western u.s you will find some native species but most of them are dwarfs so you, you really won't encounter them, maybe in pots, but they'll thrive in there. Mm -hmm. So if they're in like a plant pot or something, you're already giving them what they need. Yeah. And if they're not in your yard, you can't really do anything to encourage them, something like that. Yeah. 
Okay. Maybe maybe keep wild populations down, but that seems quite drastic because you need to collect a lot of introduced species. Oh, like to reduce competition. Re so, yeah, to reduce competition. I've seen a lot of competition, and I'm not sure if that's recorded in their status as a species. But I feel that it just be so hard to collect all the introduced species i found around a thousand porcelia scaber around my house so you mm -hmm. know you're not gonna it's gonna be hard to go out there and collect every single specimen you know to kill them just wouldn't be a and you could trampling around could even harm native species habitat destruction so right right that makes a lot of sense so what are some of the uh species that you have encountered in your area some of the, the native isopod species you encountered in your area a lot of aquatic species i found a subterranean aquatic species which lives in the aquifers underneath the ground um ligadium elrota i hope i pronounced that right i have no clue mm -hmm. um, and there's only one subspecies here which is the nominate subspecies okay and those oh and one dwarf species. And those three, or those four, are really the only native species around here. Okay. But you've encountered all of those. So um, the Legidium L. Rodi, that one is, that's the one on the, the thumbnail, right? Yes. That you sent me, yeah. And so um, you were mentioning that the Europods are really, really elongate. Yes. For that species. Uh, in proportion to its body, how how long are the Europods on that? I'd say, depending on the specimen, I'd say around a quarter to half of the size. Okay. It, so. It's qu quite drastic. And that's, that's a feature of cave-dwelling species. Of mm -hmm. course, that species lived in caves for a time and then became terrestrial um, out of the caves. But they kept their long Europods. Okay. And you can find a few of them which are clear or translucent. And that's Ooh. because of living in caves. So a few individuals of that species? Of that genus. Of that genus. Okay. There are certain certain members of the genus that tend to be transparent. Yes. That that species, there's all of them look exactly the same. Okay. Um, there are subspecies, but for that you need pilopodal examination of the endopodite which okay. is the very tip of the pilopod, mm -hmm. uh, which you need a really close up for that. And most of them just live in small caves, um, Lee County, Virginia. Um, I mean, some of them are in like one, one, spe one subspecies is in Tennessee and you can find those. Okay. So are you in that area of the U.S.? Um, you mentioned Virginia and the cave system. Is that where you are? Virginia. Yes, I'm in um, the eastern shore of Virginia. So okay. not really any caves around here, but there are aquifers that you can find some, I'd say cave dwelling, but they're really dwelling in the aquifer. So subterranean species, mm -hmm. mostly aquatic. Well, what do they eat in the aquifers? Are they working on bacterial mats or something like that? It's interesting. So I've seen them come in and out of the ground and i'm not sure if that's a choice or if they're being pushed out by a water current i haven't mm -hmm. figured that out yet if they're actually coming out and eating just leaves decaying matter and going back in mm -hmm. and i believe that's it because i can culture some just on leaves so my guess is that they're eating decaying matter and leaves okay i, I think that's cool you mentioned that you're culturing them uh one would think that a nice part of that type was such a specialized environment when that would be difficult to culture, but you're saying you're having success with it. Yes. And how long have you been culturing them? I've been culturing them for probably around a month. So okay. that's the danger period for this species because usually you can keep them for around a month and then they'll die off for whatever reason, an unknown reason. Mm -hmm. I believe it is for water quality. It's a water quality thing. So I'm replacing the water in the enclosure okay. or in the substrate as well. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So 
Uh, one thing that makes me think of the, that these isopods make me think of is a type of shrimp in Hawaii that I keep uh, that are endemic to Hawaii, but they they live in underwater brackish aquifers essentially that connect to surface ponds um, where seawater seeps in, um, rainwater seeps in, and so it mixes and it's neither fresh nor salt. So it's a brackish uh, water environment, but they they ascend to the ponds where they feed on algae and dead insects and that kind of thing. And then they'll go down into subterranean areas and people will discover that they inhabit an area by, for example, digging a well and the water floats in and then they see the shrimp there, even though there hasn't been a surface connection in that area for years, maybe decades, and there's still shrimp there. So that kind of makes me think of uh, this particular ice spot that seems some, some parallelism there. It's very interesting. Yes. It probably is, you know, an evolutionary thing there. And I haven't seen the extent of the range. They should be from all of Delmarva up to New Jersey should be the total range because that's how far the aquifer ranges. But I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it's a, you know, certain stream inside that aquifer that houses them hmm. or is suitable for their life. They seem pretty hardy. So my guess is that, you know, it'd span that whole aquifer. Wow. <laughs> That's really interesting. And I wonder if there are, uh, like you mentioned that there are subspecies of that species. It makes you wonder if different parts of the aquifer have different subspecies or what's going on there. Interesting. Yes, subspecies. There's more isopod subspecies than you would think. Um, Porcelo scaber has some subspecies. Pretty much every species has a subspecies of isopod, which okay. I didn't realize that when you know, getting into isopod taxonomy, that there's a lot of subspecies. You know, some species have like 10 different subspecies. I know mm -hmm. um, Porcelionatidae's Prunosus has 21, I believe. Wow. Which, of course, with them, people don't know if it's a subspecies or a species. Um, they're a very complicated species. Right, and whatever's in the hobby is probably... A complex um, inter interspecific hybrid. Yes, I found Intra lots of individuals that it's like, what? What's this? You know, is this a subspecies? Is this a species? And um, for Porcelionatidae's prognosis, you actually can't identify them with genitalia examination. You need an microscopic view of the their. their um, basically scales mm -hmm. it's and usually you need an electron microscope to see them clearly because they're so so similar and that that would explain why they're so mixed up in the hobby no and didn't you send me a picture of uh, a micrograph and it showing like this doesn't really fit either species it was like it, between florida it and, it's between yeah, yeah. I, you know i've asked a lot of fellow ice podologists what they thought and it, it was split 50 50. You know, mm -hmm. 50 of them thought that it was um, personally not at Ace Flor Floria. Yeah. Floria, yeah. But some of them didn't. You know, it was 50 50. <laughs> and some of them just said, I don't identify those. Um, I'm, not, I'm not working on those. So, like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know what to believe. I, I'm like, I, I don't identify those. I, you know, I'm on Bug Guide identifying stuff. And I'm like, nope, not, not this one. Yeah. 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 There's no way to really tell, like you said, unless you get a. Really, some really powerful microscopy going on. Yeah, some people can tell, but that's mm -hmm. really it. So, someone who was really, really into that specific area—that makes sense. So, here's a question from Alan. Welcome, Alan. Thank you for joining us. That is a species um, that I've—I know I'd have to look it up. Let me see. Does that mess with my nope? Does that mess with my thing any? No, it's yeah. looking good. No problem. Okay, let me look up that species. So it's like a dwarf and a silo. That's kind of awesome. Yeah, so I think I have an ID for that. Let me see. I need to make sure that the range is correct. That's a lot of isopod species. You need a range. You need to look at the range to be able to keep tell what the species is. Mm-hmm. My guess is that one's not native, but it could be. Let 
let's see. I if it's what I'm thinking, it's a pretty rare one that's only been recorded a few times. So it could what environment was it found? If it was found in a salty environment, it could be an endemic species. But if it was found in just a more swampy environment, it could be an introduced species. We've got a couple of suggestions here in the chat. Here's one. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. That's that'd be right. Unless it's there are some native species that also are small, clear and conglobate like that. Hmm. That's an interesting idea too. Cool. That's some fun stuff. The, uh, I can, is it, I've heard of one that circulated in the hobby known as picopods, and I don't know if that's related at all, if that's something entirely different. I, I wanted to get some of those to look at them. There's, mm -hmm. there's so many small species, but it, you know, it depends on how small the species is because it could just be a juvenile. Mm -hmm. Um, of course the ones in the hobby, that's a different species. That's a small species, okay. but the, species just mentioned could just be a juvenile which get bigger and that help with an ideas and right. environment you know the environment's crucial right like you were saying if it's in a salty area or not yeah well we've got a lot of people in the chat this is great 56 people i can see kevin muhammad shauna heaven 503 alan john he's alan john did say they resemble the pico pods and he's trying to get a hold of some he did say, I think if I remember seeing it in the chat somewhere, that the uh, the little isopods that he collected, the conglobating ones from Florida, have been breeding for him. So, okay, so he's figuring they're not juveniles because they're already breeding. Yep, that is probably a dwarf species. I'd have to check and see if there's a lot of introduced um, dwarf species to Miami. And there's a lot of native species, too, so it'd be really hard to tell because it could be undescribed native it could be an under undescribed invasive or introduced or it could just be an introduced species mm -hmm. cool and for them the examination is a little harder because they're so small and mostly it's antennae that you need to examine for mm -hmm. a species id okay are you looking at like articulations on the antennae things like that yes Mm -hmm. That seems to be a, a and pretty eyes and you know it's basically this more morphology of the whole organism and not the pelopods. Usually, it's pelopods. Really, the only way you can identify them is pelopods. But most dwarf species, the pelopods are so small that you can't examine them. You can't even see. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think you talked a little bit about this earlier, but it's been a while. So um, why don't we bring this up? Yes, I have found multiple true native terrestrials. I have found one um, Ligdium elrodi, which has some subspecies. I only found the nominate subspecies. There are, in Tennessee, there's a subspecies that you can find, um, just which is terrestrial. But most of them, most of the subspecies are native to certain caves within the U.S. And there's probably definitely some undescribed subspecies there. Yeah, I think I've seen very few native isopods myself. I once found uh, Venezilo arizonicus in my blue death painting beetle incubator. <laughs> so, those, are, those are really cool. I like the, that species. Yeah, um, and, but I only found one, and so I wasn't able to get a culture going or anything like that. Okay, here's a question from Kevin. Yes, there are multiple. I would have to look at the literature because there's – some obscure species that are probably native there. Um, definitely some aquatic species. If you want to raise aquatic species, subterranean aquatic species. Um, in the U.S., there's around 100 aquatic species, native aquatic species, and 100 terrestrial species. And the, the actually, there's probably more around 200 
native aquatic species. But we've Freshwater just, aquatic. So many that are undescribed, probably. Yes, there's so many. There's been some recent work done to describe them all, but there's so many caves and aquifers that all of these subterranean ones haven't been described yet. And really, isopods in general need a whole redescription. The taxonomy is very complicated. There's a few species that were just considered different. Like the person, the description was, these look different. You know, let's identify them as a different species. No holotype or anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And well, one before we go on, and like Kevin says, Piscaber and Oniscus cells definitely not natives. Definitely of European introduction. So yes, good point. Okay, here's the next one. I like Ligdium aroda. Um, I also like some of the aquatic species. I think the aquatic species are really cool. Freshwater aquatics, you can find them pretty much everywhere. Um, and some of them actually live in cow patties. They, <laughs> they will, it's really weird. They'll basically crawl up on land from the water and they can live in the cow patties. The moisture is enough that they just live in the cow patties. Um, so aquatic species that specialize in living in cow patties. Yes. <laughs> There's so many weird behaviors with some of them. When competition comes, they shrink down in size and they're mature, but they shrink down in size to battle that competition. Interesting. Plasticity of the species. So the species have a high plasticity, which means that they can change. Um, they basically, it's like a rapid evolution. Um, some species that inhabit vernal pools will, when the vernal pool dries up in the summer, they'll dig down into the substrate, substrate and hibernate, hibernate, mm. which is, cool. was recently described. I think 2010, it was described. So mm -hmm. aquatic species, there's a lot of undescribed behaviors and very cool behaviors. Interesting. Now, when you say that they can shrink down in size, are you saying that an, not just like a population decreases its average size, adult size, yeah. but an individual? An individual can. Okay. Because that, that brings me back to those same shrimp, another crustacean with a parallel adaptation. You know, I was talking about the the uh, shrimp that live in the the um, in Keyline pools in Hawaii. One documented behavior that they demonstrate if they are denied food a lot will shed their skin, but instead of expanding, they, they shrink. That's super cool. So it must be a very similar sort of a parallel behavior in another crustacean. Yeah, it, it makes sense. You know, the evolution, they're kind of involving in um, different environments, but kind of the same subterranean environments. Right. And the fact that um, there's a way for them to decrease size. I mean, it's difficult for a mammal to do that, for example, but it makes sense that a crustacean could do that by molting. And then they need fewer resources until things improve so yeah it's, it's really cool here's another question okay this is just reading lots and lots of articles i've probably read around 500 articles 500 600 articles and that's just for identification um mm -hmm. It's just really you have to find the isopod. I usually use um, worms or the World Register of Marine Marine Crustaceans. Marine. Anyway, I use some sources basically to find out the species. I and mean, then you find the source of the or the original description. Then you have to track down. You have to find an article online, or you know if you have access to any library or whatever, you can look for articles that way. But it's really just having the knowledge by reading articles and also going out and looking for the um, species, dissecting them yourself, if you're interested in that real species isopod taxonomy. Because for really to get a true species ID, you need to dissect specimens. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people probably don't like that because, oh, no, my, my isopods. But if you want to get into the taxonomy of it and really describe species, you need to pelopodal examination because there could be subspecies. There was once considered, not anymore, but there was once a subspecies of Porcelius scaber that was considered native to the U.S. Um, because they were calicos. The mm. calico gene, it was an European isopodologist that came over to the U.S. And they don't have 
you know, the same calico gene over there in Europe. So he thought it was a subspecies and it described it on the morphological characteristics without pelopodal examination. So the pelopods were the exact same. And then later, another isopodologist revised his work and said that the genetic research and the pelopodal examination or the pelopodal differences weren't there. So they just, they lumped them back into the same group. Yeah. So there's only two accepted species of Porcelia scaber. One of those species might not even be accepted. Um, the reason for that being that Porcelia scaber populations in coastal areas have greater granulation. Hmm. And this is an unknown phenomenon that happens in coastal populations. They don't know why that occurs. So you mean subspecies, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's very interesting. The granulation increases. So they become the rough isopod becomes rougher. Yes. They, <laughs> they're, yeah, the granulation, basically it's more of a pyramid shape. They look very spiky. Interesting. I'd like to see that. I have to check out a coastal population of species next time I get a chance. Here's another uh, comment about aquatic isopods. Hard to find to buy. Do you have any ideas for sources for um, aquatic isopods? Aquatic isopods. Really, the only place you can purchase them is from lab supply stores. And it's quite pricey, around $30 for 10 specimens. Um, so, and, you know, it, it's aquatic, so, it, you know, temperature might affect them. Now, mm -hmm. they are very easy to find. Any, pretty much any freshwater source, you can find them. Um, I don't believe any brackish or saltwater isopods have been cultured or kept. I don't believe, I'm not sure if that's even possible because they eat a wide variety of different things. Some of them are parasitic. Some of them like cannibalize. It's very interesting. But for freshwater isopods, you can go out, you can find them anywhere. And you can actually just throw tap water in a container with some leaves. Of course, you probably want to add a bubbler. And you want to make sure that there's not an algae spike or mold spike or anything like that in there um, because that will kill them. Basically, you just get some leaves. As long as the water stays clear, they're fine. And you can go out to a stream or a creek or a river, and you can just scoop, basically scoop out some substrate into a container and just look through it, and you might find some aquatic isopods. Yeah, that's what I did when I was a kid, found some. And uh, those were the first isopods I ever kept, aquatic isopods from a ditch. Looks like Heaven found some but hasn't attempted to keep them. How big are they, Heaven? I'd, I'd be interested in, to hear how big they are in Montana. Specimens yeah. and funding. So large aquatic species are usually subterranean. So they, they're considered subterranean, but they're really not. You, you can find them in creeks, rivers. They're just considered subterranean because they've evolved from a subterranean environment. If they are clear or trans, if they're translucent, you probably have a subterranean species. Like a true subterranean species. True subterranean and possibly an undescribed species. Okay. Now, cool. they're very hard to distinguish. You can't, aquatic isopods, you cannot ID them off of anything except pelopodal examination. Hmm. Okay. Do you know if there are, uh, I've heard that there are populations of European Aquatic isopods naturalized here in the U.S. There are a few. Have you there's, a few those? there's a few locations. I haven't found any. They're quite rare. I believe there's a few. There's a few different species that have um, naturalized in a few different areas. But basically, you can't find those going into a creek. You'd probably have to find a river or a bay. Some of them, some freshwater isopods can survive in brackish water. And most of the introduced species of aquatic isopods do live in brackish water. Okay. And this is to basically compete or to keep competition down. Okay. I, um, I've kept some, some marine isopods that uh, came with a live rock in my uh, reef tanks that I used to keep. And there are, they're not very big, but the, I had quite a few species that did, did well. They, they bred like crazy. But they were they were very small. I had a 
different types of there were copepods and isopods and, and uh, amphipods all all going like crazy in there. It seems to be a fairly common thing in saltwater aquaria. Yes, um, a lot of basically, I think most of the isopod species are from saltwater mm -hmm. um, marine species, and there's huge diversity there. A lot of synonyms. You, really, the taxonomy is terrible. You can't. That's with basically all of isopods do need a revision but there's just so many species, you know, around 10,000 species of isopods. Um, just, that's just described species that you really can't re-describe every single one. Right. And it, with all the undescribed species out there, who knows, maybe there are 20,000 altogether. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So have you ever worked with the, I've, I wonder if the species I had was like an Acellus aquaticus or something like that. It looked kind of like Pro it. Probably, know, yeah. And then have you ever worked with this species, the Lyrceus? Yes, I've seen them around. They basically look like the Acellus. Mm -hmm. um, basically, they're pretty much almost identical. It's face shape. They're basically all aquatic isopods, um, freshwater aquatic isopods are the same same care i just throw some leaves in some tap water and just throw them in there and they all do fine cool oh here's here's an interesting thing okay um the spherillo Sphir um genus is basically all temporary species or it's a temporary genus basically meaning that they couldn't get the um, isopods to go into any other genus, so they erected that genus to clump them in there. So basically, every single one of those species needs to be redescribed. So it's a polyphyletic genus, and people are just saying it's our placeholder genus, basically. Yep, it's just a placeholder, and there's a lot of that. Um, Cuberus, basically just a placeholder. There are a few true Cuberus species, but Cuberus mm -hmm. marina, um, they lost their holotype and basically all specimens. And so thus, they don't they don't really exist. There's no way to confirm that, that they exist. So basically, all of Cuberus doesn't exist. Cuberus is a really messed up genus. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I've wondered about that. And we've seen some reclassification of some of them, like the, uh, the Nezodilo that comes from what used to be some Cuberus, like the... Uh, I think it's the Shiro Utsuri has become an Ezodilo and things like that. So it's funny what's going on with all of that. Oh, here's a question. I, I know the answer to this, but do you want to field this one? So yes, this species that you're talking about does have a symbiotic relationship with ants. I actually haven't ever found any. They are an introduced species. And where I am on Delmar Delmarva, they haven't came here yet. I've flipped over so many rocks and found so many ant hives and just can't find any. Um, I believe they eat the frass of the ants or something in that manner. They feed off of something that ants give. They aren't basically solely attached to the ants. They can live on them on their own and they have been found living on their own. Mm -hmm. So they're a the, uh, facultative commensal. Yes. Is this one of the genera that does that? I think I've seen yes. that. Yes. Yeah. Yep. There are a few others. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but there are a few others that colonize with ants, but that's the most common found in the U.S. And I believe probably the only one found in the U.S. Okay. Cool. Let's see. Oh, the tongue eater. <laughs> I suppose. That's one I don't want to culture, that's <laughs> for sure. That's what Therapod Hunter was saying. T tongue eater, yes. <laughs> That'd be right, great. Right now, the species name escapes me, but I know the one he's talking about. There's, there's, I believe, a few of them. And there's, I'm very interested in parasitic isopod species, especially ones that attach to fish, especially the gills of fish. Mm -hmm. They're very intriguing because basically one specimen will start out as a juvenile and that juvenile is a male. When they 
go into a gill of a fish, what happens is if another male goes in there, they will molt and turn into a female, scaring the other male out of the gill. And then <laughs> they'll reproduce in that gill. And then some species, um, the larva will then attach to coat pods. And when the coat pods, you know, they do their thing. I mean, they'll kill the coat pod and they'll go and they'll find a fish and they'll live in the gill and it just continues that way. But there's a great diversity of parasitic isopods, probably probably around 100 species. Wow. Yeah. I the um, It's almost coming back to me that I remember the species name is Izigua and the genus name starts with a C. But for some reason, I can't get the rest of it. Um, oh. Hmm. Yeah, so this is called the, um, I believe, gonopod. I, I hope I'm not saying the word for millipede genitalia. Oh, that but, is that is the word for millipede genitalia. <laughs> maybe that's not that's not the way you pronounce it, but it's a segment of the, it's one of a, it's a leg, basically. And it is, it, they're little tiny, basically crab claws. And that is used in identification. And that's a... <laughs> something that terrestrial isopods don't usually possess, which is why we say isopods, same foot, right? But some of the aquatics have it. Yes. Let me see. Okay, let's see. Let's, what's that? Yeah, I just, I just, gonopods are reproduction. So I don't, is I'm not sure. Maxillip, is it maxillip, maxillipad? Is that what I'm thinking? I don't know. I can't remember. Okay. Oh, and Heaven was talking about her the isopods in Montana. So the largest is about a quarter inch. Okay. So this is probably a common species. Of course, you can't identify them unless you want to dissect dissect some, and then you need a compound microscope, and it's it takes some getting used to. Um, now, some species possibly can be distinguished by head patterns, but that hasn't been proven yet. Okay. And then let's see. So she's going to actually keep some once she goes down to lake on purpose. She said they just kind of showed up um, in her aquarium by accident. It, then, yeah, it'd be great to find, you know, to culture them, find new subterranean species. There's a lot of subterranean species that haven't been described in the U.S. That really makes a lot of sense. Oh, here's an interesting idea. An interesting question. This would be more of an ant behavior, which I don't know much about ant behaviors. I could imagine that ants would carry off isopod frass, but I don't know exactly. I do know that isopods eat their own frass, you know, for copper and all the nutrients. Ants could be doing the same thing, but I don't know much about ant ta taxonomy or behavior. Mm -hmm. But it seems lo logical that if they are carrying it off, they're finding some nutritional benefit from it. Probably copper, I'd imagine. Yes, there are. Um, I don't believe there are any, there are a few marine species that are endemic um, to the waters there, but of um, Long Island, but I don't believe there are any terrestrial subspecies there, but there are a few. There is um, ligdom species. I'm not sure. There's two, so there's two species that are pretty much identical to each other which you really need pelopodal examination to know, but there's that genus and there's some dwarf species there as well. Okay. How about this one? Have you ever worked with Alaniscus perconvexus? I have not. That's, hmm. that's a cool one. I like that one. Um, anyone else keep U.S. native marine terrestrial species? I've heard of that species that uh, Oren talks about in his uh, his book. It's uh, the Gia palisi or something like that. That's really really large. I've never seen that species. 
but it seems like that it would be a really cool, very large species, but it's also hard to keep alive without specialized temperature. Right? Yeah, so they're very cool species. Um, there's a few native species in that genus to the U.S. too, I believe. Um, I can't remember if that one was one of the natives, but there are a few natives in that genus. Now, I've seen the Legia exotica, which is not native, correct? Correct. Um, they were actually one of the first introduced um, isopods to the U.S. on the hulls of European ships. Mm -hmm. And it's the only species that I find here on Delmarva. Okay. Those are amazingly fast. Yeah, yeah. I tried to catch some once because you really need to look at their legs for a species ID. Mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't catch any. They, they're always running around. Um, they kind of remind me of the um, native species that is totally terrestrial, um, but they are easier to catch because they'll kind of freeze if you touch them. Um, mm. The terrestrial species that's similar? Yeah. yeah. They're similar, but they're actually not direct descendants, which is weird because if you look at a photo side by side, they look pretty much identical to each other. Mm -hmm. But their behavior is very different, it sounds like. Yeah, when I was down in Florida, I think in 2015, that's where I first saw them. And I was able to catch a couple, but after much effort <laughs> and a little luck, I caught a couple of them just to observe for a moment. But it's amazing how fast they are. They're like a totally different group as far as isopods go. You don't expect to have to chase your isopods. <laughs> well, when you said that, they actually could be. There's debate that they're actually not even... And are there a not in the Aniska in this day? Forget, forget Aniskidea. Yes, Aniskidea. Um, it's debated that they're not in that, and genetic research suggests that they're not in that. They suggest mm -hmm. that. So basically, the morphological research suggests that every all isopods came from one common ancestor or involved at one time. It was one push to land. Well, gen the genetic research suggests that they involved basically side by side at different times. Um, mm. So they believe that they probably shouldn't even be classified in that. Interesting. So isopods as currently constituted may not actually be a monophyletic group. Yep. Hmm. I guess that it, ties into the, the evolution we wanted to talk about. So that's good. Yeah, it's very interesting genetically. You know, the genetics is saying one thing and the morphology is saying the other thing, mm -hmm. which and, is, is it's really difficult because, you know, for taxonomy, you take a look at the genetic species concept and the morphological species concept. And usually they go hand in hand, but this time they're against each other. So it's like, what do you believe? Yeah. Yeah. We've got some conflicting information going on. That's very interesting. So, uh, you're saying that there's one of them is basically lending evidence to the idea that there was one terrestrialization event. Yes. And the other is saying, no, there were multiples. Yeah. Morph morphologically, it suggests that there was just one push to land. Um, and then the genetically, it says that they involved basically through time, multiple different um, genera. Hmm. And I wonder if that happens, if that has to, anything to do with the idea that maybe some of them went, uh, started terrestrialization, then went back to water and then came back out. And and because yeah. you were mentioning that that seems to be what's going on with some of these leaving the caves and then going back or, or things like that. Yeah. And um, they believe it used to be believed that the terrestrial isopods came from a um, freshwater aquatic species because they were the first isopods to basically terrestrialize um, Pangaea, um, the okay. supercontinent. So they were the first ones aquatic um, freshwater isopods were. So they thought the aquatic ones involved into terrestrial. But genetic research shows that marine species involved into terrestrial species. Hmm. <laughs> wow. That, that is such an interesting idea. I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. <laughs> very, very complicated. And that's that's related to what uh, Grant is saying here. 
closely related, yeah. numerous closely related yet independent lineages. Interesting. And how these strange pets. <laughs> it sounds like he probably has one of my shirts too. <laughs> I just want you all to notice that Nathan is wearing one of my shirts. Can everybody yes. see that? Thank you for doing that. I love that. You're welcome. You're wearing that. I was mentioning to him that I think this is the first time, may not be the first time, but it's the first time recently, at least, that someone in the live stream has been wearing one of my shirts and it's not me. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay. Here's a question from Heaven. Yes. Um, pelopods there's some that sounds a little bit more like um gamorous i might be saying that totally wrong but that seems more of like an amphipod species um, the little um swimmer rats it could just be pelopods pelopods will do look a little bit like um swimmer rats but that sounds a bit like an amphipod hmm and they can be difficult to do, distinguish. The amphipods being more laterally compressed and isopods generally being more dorsally flattened. But yep. there is there is a lot of confusion there um, sometimes. But the uh, the pleopods, I, I could totally see those in in the, the freshwater species that I had, the pleopods looked like swimmerettes. And the, yeah, and they, they, they really do. You they, know, some of them can extend a lot. Mm -hmm. And they, they flutter. Yes, they like they, they do in a stream. Yeah, yeah, that that's very hard because um, I examined some under the microscope live specimens. I don't want to kill them, um, especially the subterranean species, and it's so hard to see things because it's they're all flapping. You can't see anything under the compound microscope because mm -hmm, everything's just yeah. It's just like woohoo! It's all blurry. <laughs> Okay, here's a question that's not exactly about natives, but it is a species that's established in Florida now. <laughs> they reproduce quite fast. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't keep them because I don't want them getting... I keep another dwarf species, and I don't want them to, you know, mix and it to get into my other um, cultures and take over them, those cultures. Right. They, they're a risk. You have to make sure you keep them quite distant. I keep mine socially distanced from other isopods. And uh, the w w to a certain degree, the warmer the temperature is, the faster they'll reproduce. You get too hot and you'll kill them, obviously. But up to about 85 or so, they just go like crazy. And like Vicabulus was saying, they're parthenogenic. So each is a female, doesn't need to find a mate, and it can they can all produce offspring. So yeah, yep. really fast, especially... Well, I've noticed in the summer because it's warmer in my critter room and they just go crazy in the summer. So, yeah, I'd be worried they go into my other cultures and I, I have some, you know, most of my cultures are so I can examine them. Um, Porcelia lavis. I mm -hmm. would like to talk about a little bit about that. So mm -hmm. the morphs, they can't breed. Now I haven't done any morphological examination of any specimens, but behaviorally, which is a form of taxonomy. Right. They are very different. They are probably different species. Problem I find is there's no data on the site of collection. There's no location of where they are. There's so many Porcilio Lavis lookalikes because the group that they are grouped into is the Porcilio Hoffman Segai group. So there's so many species that look like Porcelio Lavis that you'd need an exact location to get a grasp of what species are around. Now, the California mix, they are Porcelio Lavis. Okay. But the um, Porcelio Lavis orange, Porcelio Lavis dairy cow, Porcelio Lavis milkback, they possibly all could be a separate species. Hmm. And do you think uh, since Porcelio orange won't, doesn't seem to cross with either milkback or dairy cow. Do you think that's a separate species from dairy cow and milkback as well? I would believe so. There's, I've heard, you know, people, I've um, made a, some predictions about that and people have commented, you know, well, the color just isn't showing. And 
genetically that wouldn't be the case. Um, there'd always be variation. If you cross bred um, two morphs, there would be some variation within that, them. Um, and for and species, their um, genitalia is so small, any, ver any slight variation there could change it. So if the Porcelia levis orange was in the hobby long enough, it could have been isolated within the hobby itself mm -hmm. um, because it only takes around 20 generations for a species to morphologically or genetically diverge. And so you could have someone within three or four years do that with isopods. Yep. It depends on the genetic um, mutations within that population. So how um, genetically diverse the gene pool is. I've mm -hmm. seen some species now are basically becoming deformed because of constant crossbreeding with um, recessive alleles, especially co-recessive alleles. Mm -hmm. Can you think of an example, a specific example of that? There are some um, armadillidium maculatum that have basically their segments are raising um, mm -hmm. and there's some, some examples of that on Reddit. And I also have some Porcelius scaber Dalmatian that they've started to become, it's not a, it's just a cosmetic basically deformation, but mm -hmm. I found an armadillo vulgaire, um, in my yard, which also had that, which was a co, it was a yellow, um, female, which mm -hmm. is probably a co-recessive thing within the population, which mm -hmm. it doesn't harm them. I've seen a lot of, you know, comments of people saying, you know, Colum, you know, it's, it's bad for the population. You know, if these get into the hobby, it's going to damage stuff. And if the, that genetic mutation is already in the hobby, you know, if they came from isopod species that were in the hobby, it's going to stay. There's, you know, you can call them or call them cool. Call them. I always say call. Call yes, call them. It just sounds like I'm saying call call them, <laughs> but um, you know, there's no point because I've seen the mutation on several different several different times. So there's mm -hmm. no way to get it out of the hobby. It's already here, and it's not affecting the life of the isopod. Mm -hmm. It doesn't da damage or make molting difficult or anything like that. No, I, I've seen that trait uh, in pictures of Armadillidium gestroi, and I've seen it. In uh, Oren's book talks about it in Porcelia labus. Yes. Yeah. You know, the lifting of the, the edges of all the body segments. Okay. Well, thank you, Wally. Appreciate it. This, this has been fun. We were talking about some topics we've never really covered before, so it's, it's fun stuff. And... Let's see, I just had another question that related to what we were talking about. What was it? Ah, here's a, here's a good question while I'm thinking. I love Porcelius Gaber. I'm obsessed with Porcelius Gaber. There's a lot of variation genetically that I feel makes them a unique species in the genus. Mostly just color mutations, but there are some morphological variations like with the increased granulation and their um, lateral and median lobes, which is basically just their nose, um, mm -hmm. is always very, it always varies. So there's really no way to tell if it's, you know, Porcelia scaber, if it's a Porcelia scaber subspecies. In Portugal, there's so many porcelain skipper lookalikes that are undescribed that you can't you can't you know decide what's what and there are some um porcelain skipper lookalikes or porcelain skipper that are completely orange and they have a um, obtuse um, medium lobe hmm so it, it it's coming out at a different angle basically. yeah so basically the median and lateral lobes they are what you use to identify porcelio, porcelio species, um, especially. So it's different between porcelio and armadillidium species, different distinguishing features. Um, in 
For cilia species, the lobes are a key feature. Also, of course, for almost all species, it's the um, pelopods. But for the external anatomy, it's the lobes. Hmm. Cool. So, haven't had a question about aggression. Are um, which porcelio species do you have in with your spiny iguanas? Um. Yeah, let's see what she says about that, but we'll come back to that. And yeah. Diego, Diego is confirming, or Diogo, not sure if I'm saying that right. There are a ton of peacekeeper looking ice pods in the composting bins in Portugal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If in Portugal, you're not going to be able to describe those. There's basically, I don't know any isopodologist that can, of course, you can describe the Porcelio scaber, but there's some that look alike that you just can't describe, and they'll be left at a Porcelio genus um, ID. Cool. Okay. Uh, so basically, they're cryptic species. They're just, it's. Uh, yes, lots of Porcelio species are. Basically, pretty much all terrestrial isopods are a cryptic species. It's very hard to distinguish them. And even some of the common ones, Armadillian vulgare, mm -hmm. um, Erver in California, around Mexico, those probably are an endemic species of um, Armadillidium. Mm -hmm. But there's no way to tell. There's no researchers, there's no isopodologist out there checking the um, pelopods. Okay. That's, that's interesting. It'd be fun to, hopefully there'll be a time when it's easier for just a hobbyist to pick something up and they, you got an app and a lens on your phone that'll do like electron microscopy. And you can that, that would be great. That. <laughs> something like that. It might not be too far off. I mean, it's amazing what we have now. So who knows? Okay. I'm going to give a shameless plug because guess what? Aqua Gardens in. My isopods love Wally's food too. <laughs> they really do. Okay. I got to say it, Wally. It's it's incredible just watching all my isopods, even my shy ones, just go to town on the Supreme Isopod Show. Love it. Okay. Yeah. When are they going to come out with the iPhone 20 with the electron microscope? That's, that's what oh, we need. I saw, I saw a, I don't know if it was an iPhone, but I saw a phone that they have a basically it has a micro microscope feature. It's not even macro. It's like really a microscopic thing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so cool. That is cool. I, I'd like to play with that. I can tell you. How do you keep your hands from shaking though? Because every tiny little movement is so. I know. Magnified. It's so shaky. You got to put it on a tripod, I guess. But that would be cool. Oh, wow. Our time is, is running kind of low here. Um, I want to make sure, Nathan, that we get a chance for people want to check out your social media. They want to contact you, whatever. Um, how can they do that? Um, I Bug Guide. I have an account on Bug Guide. Um, contact me through there. My email is on there. Um, you can contact me through iNaturalist. I have an Instagram, um, Nature Catalog. Um, I'm probably going. I'm probably going to rename it to Iso, um, Isopedia. Oh, I like that. Better uh, do it now before somebody takes it. <laughs> oh no, no, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. And so it's it's Nature Catalog. Does it say something else right now? Nature Catalog. It's just Nature Catalog. Yes. Nature Space um, Catalog. I believe okay. it's Nature Nature Catalog. Maybe 2021. I mean, it that's, might be a little. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> I'm looking you up right now because let I me had, see. Had a message from you. It just says Nature Catalog right there, but okay. Nature Catalog 2021. Okay, cool. Nature Catalog All one word. And we have, um, so you said Bug Guide. You can email you through bugguide.net, and you can go here. Okay, awesome. Yep, and most on iNaturalist, Blast Cat, um, Blast Cat, um, all one word. I believe um, Blast is uppercase. Okay, cool. Well, that is awesome. I hope uh, 
everybody goes and follows you on Instagram and that kind of stuff. And you know where to go now when you have isopod questions, especially about native isopods here in the U.S. Um, it's great that in the hobby we have different specializations, you know, uh, people looking in different directions. It's, I think it's great. And being able to share knowledge uh, on, on things like this, um, I think is awesome. So we do have another question from Alan. I have not. Um, I don't. So um, people call them um, neo porcelainonidase. I don't agree with that term just because there's a lot of genuses of isopods that could be they could be grouped into. Um, I believe it could be that that um, species, but some isopodologists don't believe so. I hope to acquire some one day to examine them. Now, um, Brasilio, um, Brasilionatides, um, Virgentus is actually an uncertain, uncertain species. They don't know if it's valid or not. They don't know if taxonomically it's val a valid species. So who knows if that species even is even valid. Hmm. Interesting. So I think that's where the name Neo Porcelionatides comes from, is because people don't even know if it is Porcelionatides. Okay, cool. Well, that's good to know. Well, it's just about time to close up, and I'm sorry because we have people coming in, and we we've got a lot of people in the stream. It's been great, and it's been awesome to have you here. Thank you, Nathan, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And remember to check him out on Instagram and on bugguide.net. And uh, just to give you a little teaser, I saw that Permian Exotics is in the chat and just joined in. He is going to be our guest next week. So um, everybody keep your eyes open for that. Make sure that you show up there. Thank you for joining us with Nathan. And uh, everybody have a great evening. And, we'll, and be sure to catch my video on Friday as well.